Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, congrats on making it to the end of the day. Uh, so being the very last presentation, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but here we are. Um, so we are going to talk about preview environments with Argo CD. Uh, I'm Brandon, as introduced. Um, I'm at CodeFresh as a principal technologist. I also handle a lot of go-to-market stuff. But the most important thing is I get to spend a lot of time playing around with Argo. So that's very fun. I'm going to start with what seems like a very obvious question that I think everyone in this room is going to go, oh, I, I know what a preview environment is, so why are we discussing this? Um, but what I want to talk about is that preview environments mean different things to different people. Um, and a preview environment for you might be a namespace, it might be a cluster, it might be a set of clusters, it could even be a region, um, or in the case of like Mike's great talk earlier, it could be V clusters as well. Uh, so preview environments really differ from person to person. And what I want to talk about today is how Argo is trying to bridge that gap with their generators. They're making it possible to fit as many use cases as you can. So here in this image, obviously, the simplest uh, diagram I could have is you have some developer action that is resulting in some Kubernetes resource in some way, whether it's a cluster or namespace. That's what we're going to talk about today and how we're going to do that. So why should you care? I mean, that's always the question, but, but why should I really care about this? Um, what is it solving for me? And that's where I really think it's important to talk about testing, because as we move more towards modernized applications, as we move towards Kubernetes and really getting at scale, testing is just getting more and more complex. Uh, we can't really get away from it. And there's this concept of, oh, we're going to shift left. We're going to move security, testing, and a lot of things further left. Developers are going to take on more responsibilities. Um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's harder to implement in practice. but. What we want to do is, with preview environments, is help shift a little bit of that onto the developer without making it feel like a giant burden on them. Um, so that's a goal here. And we want to avoid that rework that happens in static environments. Like, I don't think anyone wants to get up into their staging, their UAT, and definitely not their production, and have a feature that's not acting as expected. So the goal is to make sure that we test this earlier in the process to truly understand the state of it. And, and really, then we can proceed forward with just better development practices. We want to avoid really ugly merges as well, because I'm sure many of you have been here involved, either from the DevOps side or the developer side, that uh, you have multiple features that are actually clashing together, and you're hitting some really nasty merge conditions, um, and it may not even come out until you're actually testing. So this gives us an opportunity to be a little bit more dynamic about how we create our test environments, and we can merge feature sets together into a preview branch that gets built out into a preview environment. So if you have two high-profile features that you know are potentially going to conflict with each other, let's create a controlled environment where we can test that, and maybe you have a QA resource that can also help you validate that out. So that can be a very good approach to this. Uh, one other thing is, and I was kind of talking about this earlier, but you really need to comprehensively understand that behavior that you actually have within your applications and within your features that you're testing. Um, the reality of the situation is a lot of times your dev environment or your integration environment or every, whatever you want to call it, it becomes kind of a dumping ground and what developers do because they're focused on delivering their story points is they deliver their code and they go hands off. And it turns out something's broken in the integration environment and it basically becomes a case of whoever found it has to figure it out. Uh, that's not a fun scenario, right? And I think the developers are going to push you off because that's not their goal to worry about that, right? Their goal is to work on the next thing of code that they have to deliver. So this, again, gives you another platform to understand that feature behavior a little bit better before we move on. So let's talk about some use cases. So I'll start with the good, and some of these are going to be obvious. Um, as we move into some of the other sections, maybe a little less obvious. Uh, but the first one being microservices. I think most people on Kubernetes are doing some sort of microservices or mini services or whatever you want to call them, depending on what you kind of had to go with at your organization. Uh, they're just a naturally good fit for this, right? They're kind of bite-sized. You can easily test them in a preview environment. Ideally, if you really followed microservices, you know, best practices, you don't have a lot of uh, other dependencies that are going to cause problems. So that can be very helpful. If you have projects with heavy concurrent feature work, so in other words, you know, you have like a, a big project release coming up. You have 20, 50, 100 developers all working on features at the exact same time. And I think we all know that when you get towards the end of a sprint, they're coming in hot a lot of times, right? You might have you know, 80, 75, 80% of the features getting delivered right at the end of the sprint. Um, so if you have projects like this, it can become kind of the Wild West in those integration environments where we're merging everything into the main branch to, to really queue up this release to kind of push it through. Uh, so if you have that situation, these preview environments can help you peel off a few of those key ones. Again, identify, test, figure out what you need to resolve before you kind of merge it in with the main feature set. 
Static environments are another interesting one. So, uh, you know, we work with a lot of folks that have static environments that um, they're going to have to have code freezes in, right? Because they might have external customers that are depending on it, or even internal customers that need to utilize an environment in a specific way. And once code is delivered into this track, it's got to be frozen, right? So you end up with developers who are kind of like hung out to dry for a little while because they're waiting to see where they can actually test their change at, and they don't really have a good environment to do that in. So this gives them a little bit of an opportunity to spin up an environment that suits their needs to actually test it out. And then just Argo and preview environments is a great combination, right? I think we can all agree with that. Uh, a lot of the recent development in Argo has made this so much easier, and we'll talk about that, um, but it's really just improving things. So I'm going to talk about the bad, but these aren't really bad, but I wanted to say the good, the bad, and ugly, so this is what we have. <laughs> uh, but these are potentially bad things, right? Um, so APIs, for example, can seem like an obvious use case. You're like, well, I can really get out there and test this in a preview environment. It's going to be very easy. Depending on how much dependency you have on other services or other services have on you as an API and also how you set up ingress routes, this can be a bit of a trap um, because API testing can really lead to very unexpected results. Um, and you're likely going to have to build out preview environments with multiple services. So you may find that to be a good thing. You may not. It can actually be a very good use case, but you need to watch out for some of the caveats there. Anything that has heavy database mutation or depends on messages or basically external, external infrastructure that you have to consume from and you're changing things can be tricky. It's not that it shouldn't be done. It's that you just need to be cautiously aware of it. Because, for example, if you're deploying, let's say, a new version of a customer messaging service, and that customer messaging service is you know, it's consuming off of Kafka or something like that, um, and you're consuming the same messages that the service that's currently in integration is consuming, you're going to start to wonder where these, you know, these missing messages are going. And, and it can be a really confusing thing if not everyone's in the loop on exactly what's going on. So you need to be careful about where you're consuming from. And then I also have core services. And what I mean by this is, let's say I'm a business-to-business -business retailer, and I have a pricing engine, right? And that pricing engine affects effectively everything in the company, um, right? It's, it's you know, on manifest, it's on the checkout process, it's in all of these different places. You can test these in preview environments, but it can be tricky to really understand the full implication of what you're changing in an engine like this across the entire ecosystem of what your you know, company really utilizes and organizes. So that can be quite tricky. Uh, so you can do it, but again, you need to truly understand the scope of the services that you're trying to utilize and how you're actually going to play off of that. So here's the ugly. Uh, I don't think there's going to be too many surprises here, but you know, monoliths, they're not really a great use case. It's not that you can't use a monolith to do this, because uh, you definitely can. I've worked with many people that put monoliths into preview environments, um, but there are a lot of potential bad repercussions here. Uh, there's resource usage issues. There's just the impact on other external infrastructure supporting services that you really need to be aware of. Um, so monoliths, again, it's not that you can't do it, but it's probably not the ideal use case here. Um, I think what you'll see is a lot of times as co companies are going through like modernizations, they're taking monoliths up, they're going to split them up into smaller, more bite-sized services, probably not microservices, but somewhere in between, and then they can really start to see the benefits of things like preview environments. Uh, if you have microservices with hard coupling, uh, you probably didn't really do microservices right, but it happens all the time, right? So you're going to have some hard coupling between microservices that can make it very tricky. If your preview environment to test one service requires you to bring in 20 other microservices, you have kind of a problem. Uh, it's probably an architectural problem, but it's also a problem for preview environments. Uh, that's just a tricky thing to actually deal with. And then load testing is an interesting one because I've seen preview environments used for load testing, and it can give you some cursory information for sure, but the reality is it's never going to be very accurate compared to your production resources, you know, your actual environments that you want to have sort of a true metric from on how is this going to perform compared to what I expect it to look like in production. Uh, it's very difficult to generate exact load unless you have the exact resource specifications as your production environment and the exact load there. So you can do it, pretty tricky. Uh, and the last one here is more of a philosophical one, but it's just an inflexible culture. Um, there are a lot of organizations out there who they have their static environments, they have, a de they have a dev, they have a sys, they have UAT, they have a production, and that's all they want to stick to. They don't want to have to manage any resources outside of that. Um, it's not a problem that you can't change, but it's definitely a problem that can make it very difficult to get developers and your DevOps folks and kind of everyone else within the ITOR organization 
into a situation where they're ready to kind of have preview environments and understand the impact that has on developers and how they deliver code. Uh, so that one, that's up to you guys to figure out. It's your companies, you know, you, you, can, you can tell me if it's gonna work there. Um, in my experience, usually companies that are, you know, moving towards things like Argo and Kubernetes, they already have a more open mindset to things like this. Um, but if it's a company that's kind of like, hey, we wanna use Kubernetes and Argo, but they're an older legacy software company, it's a little bit more challenging to kind of bring that culture along. So let's talk about some best practices. Uh, there's a lot here, and I'm sure, like I have here, you guys already do all of these things, right? So this is not surprising. I'm sure you guys are experts at all this stuff. Um, we already talked about shift left, but in general, we do want to shift left. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean we just want to give developers more work to do. We just want that to happen earlier in the process, but we want to assist them. We want to do it in a way that it doesn't create additional burden on the development process, on you know, the delivering feature process. Um, and of course, you know, in, in along with that, you know, we need to automate it, right? So that's kind of where Ar Argo's coming into this picture here. Uh, you wanna stick to a consistent naming strategy. This is not something that you necessarily have to do, but it's gonna make things a lot easier. Like if you're using a pull request generator or um, if you're using an SEM generator, having that consistent naming strategy is going to make it much easier to set up the Argo side to actually pick up on things and automatically create these environments. So it's a good thing to have that consistent naming strategy. And then the third one is really what we're gonna be focused on, which is pull request preview environments. This is one of the, <laughs> the simplest ways to start. I mean, we obviously saw you can get much more complicated than this earlier on, but if you have a pull request, create a preview environment. Um, you can drive it off that pull request information. It makes it very easy to understand the life cycle of it. So not only when is it created, but when does it get destroyed? Um, and how does it get merged in? You know, how do we mix features together? You can easily do that by merging two feature branches together and creating a preview environment out of that. Um, in this case, I'm using labels on GitHub, uh, so you can merge branches together and then put a label on that, and it's gonna kick off the process. So a lot of flexibility there. Uh, some other cool things that you can do, and I would suggest you do, and this I'm gonna credit Costas with that I work with, which is the automated PR comments, because this is very helpful. If you are creating a preview environment, you kick off a uh, preview environment after a pull request has been created. It can be very helpful, especially if it's a web-facing application, to go in and actually put the address or the destination of that environment on the pull request itself. Because um, a lot of times your QA folks there, you know, especially if they're gonna assist you with this, or maybe even other developers that are gonna help you test this out, they don't necessarily know where to go. I mean, they could go digging through KubeKettle, right? And they could look for your service and look for the namespace and try to figure it out. But if you have that link there, it just simplifies the entire process. So automated comments on there, very good thing to have. Um, the next one being smoke tests is a little bit trickier. I think we all know that you know, everyone would love to have you know, comprehensive smoke tests and your end-to-end -end testing is gonna take care of everything for you. It would be great if it is part of this process as well. Uh, that may not always be possible, but it's definitely a best practice. Like when you spin up a preview environment, ideally, if you have the resources, uh, you should run it through the same set of smoke tests and automated testing that you have for your regular integration environment. It's gonna simplify things, because it might catch stuff like you don't have a verified or signed image, right? you have code smell issues or whatever it is, right? Just run it through that same process so that before you attempt to actually test it in a preview environment and merge it into main, we've already kind of resolved most of the issues that we might encounter there. This one's the fun one, self-destruct. Uh, you want it to basically just go away, right? <laughs> like once you're done with the preview environment, you don't wanna have to handhold and go in and babysit and have an end of day process that cleans it all up. Um, you want this to automatically happen, and this is where GitOps is really helping us with this, right? You know, it's declarative configuration, we're assigning a state, it comes in, cleans up the process. So we want the environment to clean itself up. The advanced ones, we already talked about culture, but ingress here. So ingress is an interesting one. It could be anything from just routing a little bit of traffic into a preview environment, you know, you could do across namespaces if you really had to, although I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it could be something like a service mesh and actually splitting traffic. Uh, but it can be a very good best practice, particularly if you wanna test specific use cases. So we're not demonstrating an ingress here today, but it can be something that is really very helpful depending on what you're trying to test. And here is an image of really just like the simplest scenario, which is I have feature A, there's a pull request created out of it, it's deployed to a dynamic environment, dynamic environment A. Again, that could be any sort of resource that you want. It could be a namespace, a cluster, you know, whatever really fits your use case. All right. So where does this fit in with GitOps? And here I'm gonna give a little plug to the Open GitOps group uh, because this is really 
perfectly in line with preview environments. So you're looking for something that is declarative and versioned and immutable, pulled automatically, continuously reconciled. Preview environments within Kubernetes and Argo perfectly fit into all of those, right? So we have resources that are defining out the infra, it's defining out the environment that we want to spin up. It's also uh, stored in Git, right? So the entire life cycle of this is stored in Git, whether it's GitLab or GitHub or whatever it is. Um, so we can kind of trace between those as far as when I spin up a preview environment, I know that it's either a combination of these branches, it's this branch, um, here were some additional commits after we created the preview environment, it's automatically created, and then it lives with that life cycle of that pull request as well. So if we get rid of the pull request and close it, we clean up our environment automatically. Um, and then of course it's just benefiting from the fact that we have tools that are continuously checking for state. So here's another one that I want to talk about. Now, Mike touched on this a little bit earlier, but Argo sync phases and waves can be immensely helpful here. Um, so when you are spinning up a process like this, uh, ideally you have a very simple scenario when you're, you're kicking off a preview environment. The reality is there's often supporting things that need to be put in place, you know, whether that is infrastructure, it's additional uh, services, it's you know, whatever you really need to put in place. So I would highly recommend that you learn the sync phases and waves if you don't know them and really understand how to use the hooks to your advantage. Um, so this diagram is technically not 100% correct, but it's kind of how I think about it, which is Git is holding our state, Argo's attempting to sync our state, Kubernetes is our end resource in this case, and we have pre-sync, sync, and post-sync events. Here's some examples that you might utilize them for, right? So in our pre-sync, we might need to validate our image signature first. Uh, in some cases, you might need to actually verify compute and service availability. Now I know you guys who are all working in the cloud are thinking that's, that's silly, like, I mean, the cloud is just going to spin up. Uh, but the reality is a lot of folks are actually working with on-prem infrastructure as well where they have requirements for compute. And you could potentially run out of space or you might need to actually create a new allocation for request for space. Um, so having this as a precinct to say, hey, I'm going to need this cluster, these pods, this much resources so that I can actually spin this up can be crucially important. For a sync, um, Again, you can spin up additional necessary infrastructure. So if you have a database requirement, you could create, let's say, a dynamic Cassandra instance, populate it, get it ready for this. Um, you can check if you have service-to-service -service dependency that you need to follow up on. Uh, and then post-sync, this goes into what we were talking about earlier. If you want to put a Slack or Teams message out there with an environment link, that can be very helpful. Uh, end-to-end -end testing workflow, again, this is kind of like the dream. <laughs> but if you had your end-to-end -end testing actually working in a preview environment, that'd be fantastic. And not shown here is actually if you're in a sync fail scenario. Um, but that's also a valid use case. If for whatever reason the sync fails, what do you want to run in the case of a preview environment? A lot of times there's going to be cleanup tasks for any of the stuff that you previously set up in either pre-sync, sync, or post-sync. All right. So let's talk about the meat and potatoes of this, which is Argo application sets. Um, so this is incredibly powerful. So it's really meant to be a very flexible approach to managing deployments across multiple repos, applications, clusters, and more, right? It's kind of the catch-all scenario. It's like, okay, I need to go you know, this deep and this far. How do I do it with Argo? Argo gives you that flexibility to do that through its generators. Uh, the generators offer different levels of complexity depending on what you actually need. You can do something as simple as a list generator where you just have a list of text that it's going to iterate through and create environments that match that. It could be based on merges, pull requests, uh, the matrix, which I think of a matrix like a slot machine where you pick how many lines you want to actually you know, have. And the matrix is, oh, I want to do you know, three across and one down or whatever. Um, the matrix is kind of a many-to-many-to-many -to -many -to -many relationship manager. Uh, can get very complicated, but can be helpful if you want to mix and match, say, the uh, cluster and the pull request and a list generator. Because for whatever reason, you have the need to actually have all of that in there. Um, in our case, we're using that pull request generator that I was talking about earlier, which allows us to dynamically have an Argo application set monitoring for pull requests. In our case, it's looking at a label. It could be based on a branch name filter as well. Um, but right now, it's just going to be looking for a pull request label that says preview or whatever you want to use, and it's going to kick off that process. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to try to demonstrate here. Uh, and again, I'm just going to, I said this earlier, but uh, to someone else, Last time I tried to demo for the CNCF, Amazon went down globally. So we're going to give it a run <laughs> and see how it goes this time. Um, but we're going to start here by just uh, kind of walking through it from a simple perspective. So I have my main branch uh, you know, with this commit ID, this version of the application. Um, there's some CI process, whatever you want to use. Um, I'm using CodeFresh, but it could be uh, whatever you prefer. 
it's going to generate an image, apply the tag, we're gonna kick it off to our environment. In this case, it's in staging. What we're going to do, though, is we're gonna create a PR branch here. You know, in this case, it's called feature update index. This commit, uh, Argo is actively monitoring that re repository, so it knows that we have a pull request uh, based on the label that we put on there, or again, it could be a filter based on naming that you actually picked. It then updates the application uh, and creates a new namespace, creates the application inside of your cluster, whatever that destination cluster it is. And this could be n number of clusters, right? It could be one or 10, really depends on what you want. And we're gonna have this preview environment then out there for us ready to go. So once that's out there, it's gone through all of our testing, we validated it, you know, we did our own smoke tests, went out, uh, did some API testing against it, we know it's in good shape. We're then going to merge our brands or delete our branch. Um, in this case, we're doing a merge. So I'm merging my PR branch from feature update index into the main. What that's going to do is it is going to kick off a new build process. It's gonna give us a new image ID. This is intentional because again, we're merging into an integration where all the features are going in together. Uh, and then that's going to update our staging or our static environment up to the new version that we were just testing and playing around with. All right, so let's try it. So the first thing, let's take a look here. All right, let's just take a look at the repository real quick. Uh, there's a few things I wanna point out. The first being that if we wanna create them from the CLI, here's the commands to create the base app and the app set itself. Um, just simplifies that a little bit. Let's talk about what we have in our Helm here. Uh, this is really simple and straightforward. In a real scenario, you're probably gonna have customized with overlays that's gonna overlay certain values um, for your, each of your environments. But in this case, we just have a Helm chart and there's a couple of values that are critical in here. Really, it's this namespace one and our tag. So our namespace is going to be dynamically created based on the name of the feature branch. Uh, the tag itself will change depending on you know, what's happening, whether we're merging up to main or if we're just building out a preview environment. And if we go back here, we can take a look at the world's simplest uh, Go web server, <laughs> which is kind of intentional. So we just have a web server here. It's just saying, hey, hello, GitOpsCon. I'm on release version one. And let's go ahead and let's take a look at our namespaces right now. So we don't really have anything out there at the moment. Uh, let's take a look at our pods. That's not in Kube system. And we see, again, we don't really have anything there. So let's go ahead and create our base application using the CLI. All right, so far so good. So we'll see that this is already spinning up. We're creating our base application now. Um, and for this, this is looking at the main branch at this point. Um, and we haven't actually created our app set yet. Uh, the thing that's gonna take some time here is we're actually getting a load balanced URL so we can click through to it. Uh, very straightforward stuff here. But if we go take a look at our namespaces, we have our staging namespace now. And let's take a look at our pods. We see that we have a simple deployment now running in our staging namespace. And let's go to the cheater window here and click through. So this will probably take just a second to actually pop up. And while we're doing this, let's go back here and let's take a look at our app set that we're going to create because I think this could be very interesting. So inside of our app set, uh, there's a couple of things that I, I, I really wanna make sure that I highlight here because it's crucially important for us. Uh, the first thing being that your name here and your naming schema for your namespace is very important uh, because that's what either, if you have a manual cleanup process that's gonna have to run with this or you have uh, something depending on where this namespace is gonna be deployed, you wanna make sure your namespace is consistent and that your developers kinda stick to a consistent naming practice here. Um, the other thing being we are passing through the image tag, and again, this is so that we can promote between environments and also have a preview environment. And so we will go ahead and create this as well. And we do have create namespace equal true on. This technically isn't really necessary for us because we actually have a namespace resource in our Helm template. Uh, and the reason that we have that is so that it dynamically gets cleaned up when we merge the pull request. But if we go take a look at our application, we can see that it did deploy out. We have a incredibly tiny hello GitOps con v1.0. So let's go ahead and go back. And this time we will actually use the UI to create our app set. So we'll just call this app set default. We'll do automatic sync. I do like perm and self heal. Let's use our repository. 
And this is actually in the app set bucket. We'll do in cluster. And then for this case, because this is Argo managing Argo applications, we actually want to put this in the Argo CD namespace for this particular example. Go ahead and create this. And we'll see that our app set has been created. But of course, nothing's happening yet, because we don't actually have a branch that is going to kick this process off. Uh, so let's go ahead and go into GitHub, and we will create a very simple bump here. If I can type. And we'll just change a version. Obviously, this is not a real version, but it works for this. All right. Date. Web server. We'll create a new branch out of this. We'll update the index. And then this is a very important part here. We have to actually select our preview label, because this is what's going to kick off our process. Because again, in that app set, we're actually monitoring for that. Let's create this. Now, because it's an actual code change, this is actually going to depend on a CI process. So we do actually have the build happening here. And there's nothing really too crazy going on here. All it's going to do is actually clone it down, build a Docker image, push it out so that it's available for our preview environment here. So that'll take a second to happen once that kicks off. Then we'll start to see this go green. In the meantime, Argo itself is actually going to attempt to sync it. Now, I, what I need to do eventually is put in a little bit of a pause here or actually have it be webhook based so we know when it's actually ready to kick off that process. Because uh, this will go into a holding pattern until our Docker image is actually built and pushed out there, which is happening right now. All right, so that has been pushed. And if we go back to GitHub here, now we'll see this go green and that our checks are all good. So in other words, our CI build actually happened. Let's go back in and look at our application. And we can see that we actually have a deployment out, and it has our new tag information. So let's look at our namespace now. So now we'll see that we actually have a simple deployment feature update index 5 namespace. Uh, so that is a mouthful. But that is definitely the namespace that we want. And if we take a look at our pods here, we'll also see that we have the pod running as well. So let's go back to our cheater window here, and let's get our load balancer URL. We can see for this namespace, we can see that we are now on version 2.0 for this. And our staging environment is still on 1.0. All right, so everything is actually going smoothly, uh, which is always nice. So let's go ahead and merge this pull request. So what we want to happen, like I showed in the slide earlier, is we want it to basically clean itself up, right? When we merge this pull request, we'll have our preview environment will no longer be needed because it's been merged into the main branch. So let's go ahead and confirm that we're merging. This will actually kick off another CI build process. So if we go back here. And this time, the CI build is just slightly more complicated. We're cloning. We're building the image. We're actually going to update the manifest image tag. And then we'll push that image and image tag out. So very straightforward. Um, but it's going to give us the end result that we actually need here. And let's go take a look. We can see this is already saying, no, it's out of sync. We actually no longer need this. So this is going to work on cleaning it up. And you can see it did already clean up that application. So right now, I had it set on a requeue timeout of 15 seconds. So Argo picked that up pretty quickly. Um, and if we look at our app set, our app set no longer has a dangling, dangling application off of it because it's no longer necessary. And if we take a look at our namespaces again, we no longer have our simple deployment feature update namespace. Take a look at our pods, same story, right? So that's actually been cleaned up. So let's go look at our process, where this is at. This has actually already updated it and pushed that out. So now let's go back here. And if we look at our commit message, we've updated the image tag to this new version, which is A9F4475. Not that that really matters that much. but. It's meaning that, hey, our main branch did get this new tag that we just built. Um, and if we go into our Argo applications here, and I go into our base app, we haven't actually seen an update yet here. So I didn't change out the reconciliation timeout. So it's still set to three minutes. So let's go ahead and just manually refresh this. That's going to say, oh, we actually have a new application that needs to be deployed out here. It's going to go ahead and sync that up. And now if we go back to, let's just go back here. 
If we refresh this, we'll see that we only have one external load balance URL. It's in our staging namespace. Let's click through to that. And we can see that now we do have our preview environment at version 2.0 up there. Uh, so yeah, I think that covers everything. Uh, let me go through, I think I have one more slide here, which is just to talk about some challenges. Some of these are gonna be obvious, some not so much. Um, if you have to automate a lot of non-Kubernetes infrastructure, this could be painful. You might still need to do it, but it won't be fun. Um, if you have a ton of service-to-service -service dependencies, you really need to understand the entire landscape of what you wanna test against and know what's reasonable to actually pull into a preview environment. We kind of already covered it, but even outside of load testing, if you have performance-dependent services, it can be very tricky to do preview environments for, particularly if you're doing something like automated learning or things like that, it can be very difficult to actually get a good test run through this. Uh, comprehensive cleanup can be challenging, especially if you are creating dynamic databases and all sorts of other cool stuff. Uh, collaboration can in introduce a people process. So what I mean by that is, as a developer, if I need to test multiple features together with someone else, I have to go talk to that person now, whereas before it was I would just throw the code over the wall, it ends up in some integration environment and someone deals with it. Now you're saying, no, I want developers to be a bit more proactive about talking to other developers, understanding how their features interact and test them together. That can be challenging, but it needs to happen. Uh, and then as is any Kubernetes presentation in Argo, secrets is always a challenge. Um, I don't think there's really ever an easy solution. You're probably gonna have secrets that you need to deal with whether it's injecting through sidecars or however you wanna do that, sealed secrets or SOPs or whatever you wanna use, but that can be challenging. And that's it. Yep, uh, I do have the repo here. Uh, so if you have any questions, it's a very simple example, but hopefully it uh, puts you on a good path towards application sets. Yep, you actually have time. Yay. Thank you.